Okay, so this is uh, lecture six. As usual, without the L, we make a good beginning. Come back and see. That. So that's lecture six, and uh, so the last thing we saw in the last class was this relationship between parity check matrices and minimum distance. Okay, and I I wanted you to spend time thinking about it and how different it was from the rank. Okay, what was the relationship? D min equals minimum number of linearly dependent columns of H. Okay, so it's a very different kind of a thing to calculate for a channel. For a, I'm sorry, for a parity check matrix. I don't know why I said channel. I'm sorry. So. It's uh, it's the minimum number of linearly dependent columns of a parity check matrix, and for any matrix, this is a strange thing to calculate. And as I've said, it's uh, mostly difficult. No, why are all these desks empty? What are you guys doing at the very last? I think I want the last two rows to shift to these benches. Come on up front. <coughs> No, 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 that's the fan. Don't turn the fans off. No, no, no. Okay. All right. So that's the uh, that's the setup, and uh, and let's let's uh, let's do this by say by I mean it's it's not too difficult to guess quite quite often, but sometimes it can be misleading. Okay. So let's let's take a few examples and take a look at what we might do. The first is the example that I had before. The 6-3 example that I've been using all the time, right? Oh, sorry, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. This was my 6-3 example. Okay, how do you compute this quantity? How do you co compute the minimum number of columns of H that are linearly dependent? Okay, so the only way to do this in a foolproof fashion is to start from start from one, and then go to two, and then go to three. Okay. Don't don't try to intelligently guess saying this matrix is. I mean, you could try intelligently, but you should be very sure of what you're doing. Okay. But if you just want to take a brute force approach, first eliminate. Make sure that there is no column that is zero. Okay. That's the only way in which there can be one column that is linearly dependent. Okay. So you have to go check one after the other. Okay. Can you have d equals one? Okay. In this matrix, it's not possible, right? Why? So can can there be one column of H which is linearly dependent? It can. Yeah, if it is 0, 0, 0, but there's no there is no all zero column here. Okay, so this is ruled out. Okay, so that's how you proceed. Okay, what about two columns? Can you have two columns of H that are linearly dependent? What should be what should happen for two binary columns, two binary vectors to be linearly dependent? They should be equal. Okay, so two columns should be equal. You see, all the columns are distinct, so you know this also is not possible. And then you have to go and check if Okay, at this point you can conclude something. What can you conclude at this point? D is. I'm sorry. No, I, but when you when you looked at d equals one, you can conclude d is greater than or equal to two, right? That's the only thing you can conclude. You cannot conclude d is equal to two. Okay, keep that also in mind. Even here you can conclude d is greater than or equal to three. You cannot conclude it's equal to three. How will you conclude it's equal to three? You have to actually find three columns that are linearly dependent or three columns in this case which will add to zero okay can you can you find that yeah there are several three columns that will add to zero right for instance we we'll take this this and this that adds to zero so d equals three is okay okay and you have to actually show which columns are linearly dependent okay that's the only way to do it okay so let's try a slightly more complicated example to get used to this idea and then we'll look at some simple results that follow from this Okay. What about this matrix? Okay. It's a four by eight matrix, so it's an eight four code. I want you to think about minimum distance of this code okay let's go through the same argument can you have d equals 1 no okay so you can conclude d is greater than or equal to 2 can you have d equals 2 right you see these two are very very easy to con conclude 
what about d equals 3 okay this is difficult to conclude okay so you cannot really make any decisions on d equals 3 directly by looking remember it's very tempting to do that okay you could say for instance you have an identity column identity matrix on the left hand side the first four columns make an identity matrix and then you have every other column having at least three ones so you might say it's very tempting to conclude that there's no way there will be three columns which will add to zero but what are you ignoring there what, what is what is wrong with that argument okay you could have two columns here adding to give you some column of weight one okay it could happen okay in this case it won't happen i've chosen it that way but it could happen for instance if i replace this zero say with the one what can happen okay the same logic still holds every column here has weight at least three but if you actually add these two columns what happens you get weight one so you might get something okay so it's very sensitive to what's there on the other side and it's very difficult to generalize this argument beyond two okay and don't do it it's very dangerous unless you unless you're very good at spotting these things you'll miss it okay so in this case can you find three columns so only way to eliminate d equals three is to actually try all possibilities okay <laughs> You don't have to try too many here. Try try cases here and make sure. I mean, you have to try. You can try it in various ways. You can be smart about trying all possibilities, or you can try it just by brute force. It's quite a few to try. Try all that and eliminate. Okay. In this case, you might be able to eliminate d equals three. Okay. I believe you can. Okay. So there'll be no d equals three, but we don't know it. Remember. Okay. So this is more difficult to eliminate than the other two cases. Okay. In general. Okay. This is more difficult. Okay, so you'll see, you'll see even in construction this will be true. Getting up to d equals three, so okay. So this is this is one problem, right? Given a parity check matrix, how do you find this number d? Minimum number of linearly de depend dependent columns is uh, of h. Okay, but what I'm actually interested in is doing the reverse. Suppose I want a particular minimum distance. How do I construct a matrix so that the minimum number of linearly dependent columns is that number? Okay. You will see even in that reverse problem, we will face the same problem. Up to d equals 3, everything will be very nice. When you want to say anything beyond d equals 3, you will find just dealing with binary matrices is very difficult. Okay? There is a wonderful elegant solution to that, which is what we will see as we go along. Okay? So, which uses some more advanced mathematical notions. But using just binary fields, binary entries, is a little bit difficult to deal with that. Okay? So, that is the point I want to convey. Okay? So, let us see that more closely now. Let us look at the reverse problem. Okay, given that you want a particular D, how do you go about constructing parity check matrices with that D? Okay, so that's what we'll see next. Assuming I can go to the next page. Okay, so let's see the reverse problem. Design of H. Okay, I'll start with D equals 3, okay. Okay, that's the most uh, non-trivial thing because it can correct one error, right? So you would like to correct, start with d equals three. I mean, if you say d equals two, yeah, maybe you can have it, but you can't even correct any error with it. Okay, so maybe you're not interested in d equals two. Maybe interested in d equals three. So how do you go about designing uh, for h? Suppose, okay, the first thing you have to decide is there are too many possibilities, n, k, and d. All three you have to decide. So let's let's at least start with given n. Okay, so let's say we start with given n. Okay. You can also start with so many other things, right? So for h, you need what? n minus k by n. I'll call this n minus k as small r, okay? So you should be either given r or n, then then you have to design the other thing, okay? If you have to design, we, we will end up designing both. But we'll start with given n, okay? Suppose you're given a block length n, how do you go about constructing a parity check matrix with d equals 3, okay? So I need some, some I have to optimize something, okay, to come up with some good constructions. Okay. What should I optimize in parity check matrix? Okay. I think it's better to keep it open. Can you keep it fully open? In case there's a fire, we, we need to run out. Right? I mean, there's been a fire in this room, if you didn't know. <laughs> I'm not very serious. So. Okay. All right. So, so, so in the design, given n for a particular d, what would you like to optimize for parity check matrix? What would you like to be small or large or minimum number of rows? Why, why do you want minimum number of rows in your parity check matrix? 
maximum rate right see uh, number of rows is n minus k when you minimize n minus k you are maximizing what k and why would you want to maximize k that's the rate right so rate is very important rate versus probability of error by giving d equals 3 i am saying i can correct one error which means my probability of error will go as p squared as opposed to p okay that's good it seems to be nice but i should not pay too high a penalty in rate my rate should not become too low so i will try to minimize r in the construction of an r bar by n parametric matrix so you given n you minimize r that's the that's the goal okay so let's try a few examples before we plunge into the actual general method let's say i start with n equal 6 okay okay right so i have six columns i have to put in six columns for h so that the minimum number of linearly dependent columns is 3 okay so the, again the way to do it is make sure that the minimum number of linearly dependent columns is not 1 how do you make sure that the minimum number of linearly dependent columns will not be 1 avoid all zero columns make sure that the minimum number of linearly dependent columns will not be 2 how do you make sure that happens don't repeat any columns so you have to be able to put in six columns without the all zero column right and not repeat so what's the minimum r see remember each column is a vector from 0 1 power r right it's an r bit vector right each column is an r bit vector you see that right that's clear so what's what's the smallest r you can have so that yeah 3 right you can't have less than 3 if you have 2 what happens there are only 3 non zeros so you'll have to end up repeating so you'll get only 2 Okay, you can there's no way you can get more than uh, 2 okay so you see r needs to be 3 okay and then is there i mean how do you construct the edge is there one possibility or how many possibilities do you think there will be for cons putting in these six columns yeah 7 c 6 right there are seven different ways in which you can do it up to permutation equivalence right so you can do that but you'll see a lot of those codes will be same and the particular code that i gave you the 633 code is one such code you can go back and see just arrange it so that it's systematic but it's one such code you can have so many other possibilities right several ways of doing this okay is that clear that's how you do it okay let's try let's say n equals 13 what should happen Four, right? You need r equals four. You can't do it below below r equals four. If you have r equals three, you have only seven different three-bit vectors, and you have to start repeating. Okay, there's no way you can have thirteen non-zero three-bit vectors and not have any repeat. Okay, you don't have enough of them. Okay, so you need to go to four, and there are several possibilities now. Maybe sixteen choose thirteen possibilities. If you want to think of it that way. Fifteen choose thirteen. All right. So there are several more possibilities, but you can always do it. This is not a problem. Okay. There's also an interesting question to ask, kind of in the reverse way. Okay, suppose I'm saying I'm not I'm not given n, but I'm given r. Okay, so if you want, you can write down a general formula for this case also. I'm sorry to go back, but you can write down a general formula. What do you think the minimum r will be for a given n? Sorry, log base two, and then you have to seal it, right? So you do log base two and then seal, so that you can show will be the will be the smallest r with which you can accomplish minimum distance n okay there's also an another way of doing this design suppose you say you're given r okay given r as opposed to being given n so you're, you're told i can add only this many parity bits i can't add more than this many parity bits right so number number here is the number of parity bits you can add add r right the redundant redundant bits okay and what would you try now to maximize or minimize you will try to maximize n, right? That's the that's the goal. Is that clear? You want to maximize n, okay? Right? So you can do this in various ways. So let's again do it by example first, and then we'll generalize like that, okay? Suppose I say r equals two. Okay, let's say r equals one. I'm sorry. Let's start with r equals one just for fun. Okay, it's no big deal. If I say r equals one. What's the only thing I can do? Right? I can do only one. So I can have n equals. 1. What will be the parity check matrix? Okay, it's just a silly little game you can play. There's nothing nothing of interest here. Okay, the next thing is, let's try r equals 2. Okay, what's the maximum n I can have? 3. So, in general also the formula is very clear, right? What will be the general formula for the maximum n? 
2 power r minus 1. That's the total number of non-zero vectors you have. Okay, very easy. What will be h? 1, 0, 0, 1. I'll write it in this nice order so that you get that. Okay, what is the code corresponding to this h? Right, this will be a what will be the parameters of this code? 3, comma, what will be k? 1, right? 1, how did I get this? It's n minus r, right? And minimum distance will be 3. Okay, what will, what will be the code word? 3, 1, 3, what do you think the code word should be? Go ahead and find it if you want. How do you, how do you find the code words from the parity check matrix? Right, you remember, you have to identify where the message comes and where the parity comes, right? Here you will have the parity part and here you will have the message part. It's only a one bit message. Put in a zero there, put in a one there, you will list out the two code words. If you put a zero there, what do you get? Zero, zero. And then if you put a one there, you get one, one. Is that clear? Okay. Is that clear? Okay. So that's the code. 313. It's actually the n equals 3 repetition code. Okay. When you try to maximize n. Okay. The next interesting case, I'll, I'll use the next page for it, is r equals 3. Then you can have n equals 7 and you'll have a parity check matrix for the 733 code, 743 code. I'll write it in this form just for Okay, you can write it in any order, right? The ordering doesn't matter. Simply wrote it in this form. Okay, so this is a 7, 4, 3 code. Okay, okay, I skipped a small step in the proof. Okay, when I said I'm putting in all the r bit non zero vectors, okay, I have assumed something when I said this number was 4. What have I assumed? Say, I came up with this parity check matrix, that's fine. But then I said, k is actually 4. What have I assumed when I went from, what, have, what should I prove when I go from there to there? It's full rank, right? I have to show the rank of this h is r. How can I show the rank will be r? It's very easy to show rank as r. I can easily find r linearly dependent columns. What are those r linearly dependent columns? The identity matrix will always be there, right? So you'll have the i there. So it will always be full rank. So you know the rank will be r. That's not a problem. Okay, so you get the 743 code. Okay, all these codes, given an R, you try to maximize N. Those codes are called Hamming codes. Okay, so that's the definition for the Hamming code. Okay, so they would have what? N equals 2 power R minus 1. K equals what? 2 power R minus 1 minus R and D equals 3. That would be the parameters of the Hamming code, the binary Hamming code. Okay, so this is the binary Hamming code. Okay, it's one of the oldest codes to be invented. It's very, it's very interesting and very, very simple and nice to describe. It has error correcting capability one. Okay, so as you increase R, you will get better and better codes for the same minimum distance, right? So you see, for instance, if you if you were to write down say a table, R, N, K, and then uh, K over N. Okay, for three you got, you had seven four which is 4 by 7, okay, which is not such a large rate. Okay, Again, remember D is always 3. Okay, If you go to 4, you immediately get 15, 11, 11 by 15, which is larger than 4 by 7, right? So again, you get D, D equals 3. Go to R equals 5, you would get 31, 26, 26 by 31, which is again larger for the same minimum distance. You go to 6, you would get 63, 57, 57 by 63 is larger than this. So you see, you see the advantage with going for larger n and larger k, right? Somebody was asking me the question. For the same rate, for the same minimum distance, right? You get better and better efficiencies. But it's not a very great thing. Why? This increase is not very great. Why? Yeah, because d is still 3 and n is increasing. You can only correct one error out of, say, 63 here. There you could correct one error out of 7 bits, which is probably good. But so, so you'll see quickly what is more important is d over n and not just d. Okay. So you see what happens to d over n, that also is decreasing exponentially to 0, right? It's going down to 0. So these codes will probably not be very good for large n. Okay. 
even though they seem to be getting higher rate they probably not will not be very great when n becomes very large okay one can expect that maybe okay but they have still very good codes I mean, the, the, the efficiency goes up very much and this code has seen a lot of utility in practice okay there is a way to do something with it and make it very very useful okay okay that's the binary hamming code okay all right any questions on this oh, fine okay so i'm going to take the 743 hamming code and try to do syndrome decoding with it just for fun just to remind you that we're still in the decoding business we're not just constructing codes we also want to be able to decode it okay okay so let's try the syndrome decoding uh, with uh, for this for the 743 hamming code okay so for this for this you'll see i'll pick my parity check matrix in this fashion i'll simply write down i'll write it down and then you tell me how I, how what in what order have i done it okay this is a different order from the previous one right what is this order it's just increasing order right 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 so what i wrote it okay okay it's clear suppose i get suppose i receive some vector r Okay, suppose I say I receive a vector r and then from there I compute a syndrome s. Okay. Okay. So s is what? S is a 3 bit syndrome, right? Okay, 3 bits. Am I right? I can compute s equals h times r transpose. That is your that is your syndrome. That's what you did to get the syndrome s. Okay. So you see making this table will be very, very easy. Suppose given the syndrome i want to find e cap okay and then i can make a table right right this is what i need to do at the decoder if i, I can make this table ahead of time i don't have to do it online right when this r comes in i know i'm going to find the syndrome and then for each syndrome i'll get a particular e cap how do i find e cap from s what's the definition how do you do it the minimum weight solution for s equals h times e e transpose that's e cap right so i can do that solution ahead of time listing out all the possible syndromes right syndrome is just three bits so how many possible syndromes will i have eight possible syndromes zero 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 one all those things i can write down e cap ahead of time right this is this is the steps towards the syndrome decoder i was talking about right that's that's what that's what is done syndrome table i was talking about okay so for instance if syndrome is zero 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 what's what's my e cap going to be all zeros right so there's no problem there it's going to be all zeros okay as the syndrome changes, you'll see for the Hamming code, it's very trivial to find the least weight error vector. You know, you can correct all the weight one, weight one error vectors and you'll see all the weight one error vectors will exactly come in for each syndrome, right? You see, what is what are the different 3-bit vectors, non-zero 3-bit vectors? They are all the columns of H, okay? So, I can easily list down E cap. So, for instance, if I say 0, 0, 001, what will be E cap? 1 followed by all zero. Okay, it's very very easy to do this right likewise i can write on for instance if i say 101 what is that 0 0 0 0 1 0 0 that's it okay it's very easy so you'll see all the all the cases will be covered here 1 1 1 okay all the cases will be covered here is that clear okay okay so let's try to take a graphical view of what's happening here once again okay so go back to this graphical star and that view right right you have how many code words you have 16 code words okay the non overlapping sphere radius is what t equals 1 right d is 3 t is 1 okay so how many vectors will there be in each non overlapping sphere 1 plus 7, 8, right? Okay, number of vectors in each non overlapping sphere will be 
equals 8. What is 16 times 8? Around each code word you have a non-overlapping sphere. 16 times 8 is what? 128. Now why is that 128 special? That is all the 7 bit code words. It means there will be no vectors hanging out outside of your non-overlapping spheres. Okay, maybe that's that's a nice thing to have. Okay, I don't know. Maybe. I don't know if it's nice from a decoding or decoding or encoding point of view, but at least I know from a structure point of view it's very nice. Okay, previously we never had that, right? Most of the codes we had, we always saw. Well, for the repetition code actually we had this property, but for other codes we always saw there would be these non-overlapping spheres, but then also there'll be other vectors floating around for which you have to fight. Okay, here it turns out nothing like that happens. Okay, 16 into 8 is 128, and yeah, that's very nice. Okay. Codes that satisfy this property are called perfect codes. Okay, and there's lots of nice theory about it, and uh, all that is there. We won't we won't go into detail. But uh, but if you're interested, you can look at these things. In fact, people know exactly what the perfect codes are. There are very few of them, some uh, three or four of them, different kinds, and it's been classified. It's very nice. Okay. So I think I think that's that's all I want to say about Hamming codes. Yeah, but this idea of the syndrome table, if I did not emphasize it, is quite important. Okay, for large n and large k, it may not be that useful, but for small n, you can always do a table lookup decoder. Okay, you compute the syndrome table for all possible syndromes. You solve that s equals h e, e, e transpose ahead of time and put it in a table. Okay, and then all your decoder has to do is a table lookup. Computes the syndrome, goes to the table, finds e cap, then adds it to r and gets c cap. Okay, so that's a very simple way of implementing it. But again, for large n and large k, it will become difficult. Why? How many syndromes will you have? 2 power n minus k syndromes. Okay, if n minus k is 500, it will become 2 power 500. You can't do. So it's even for reasonable numbers, it's tough. Okay, so it's not a very efficient implementation, but one could think of doing that. Okay, so that's syndrome decoding. The next thing I want to do is deal with d equals 4. Okay, so how do you do a design for d equals 4? Here we'll use some ideas which are very simple and based on modifying existing codes okay this ideas the idea is from modification of existing codes okay there are several ways of doing modification of existing codes i will talk about a few of them now in general and then i'll pick out the one which gives us this d equals 4 construction which is very nice okay so what do i mean by modifying existing codes you have you have a code, so a set of code words. You want to do something to it to come up with another code. Okay, so you might change. So you have n, k, and d. No, you might want to change, do some modification to change n, n and k, and that might imply some change in d. Okay, so that's the thing we'll do: modifying codes. That's the general idea. Okay, so I'll first do the modification that results in d equals four. Okay, and then we'll look at other modifications. The first modification is what is called extension. Extending a code. Okay, suppose I have a NKD code C. Okay, I have an NKD code C. Okay, I will make a new code which I will call say CE. Okay, I don't know how do I want to call it. I'll, I'll call it like this. It means C extended. Okay, this is going to be. Okay. Let me write it down carefully. Okay, vectors of the form x0, x1, xn minus 1, and then an xn such that x0, x1, xn minus 1 belongs to C, and then xn equals x0 plus x1 plus xn minus 1. Do you understand? This is what I'm going to do in extension. Okay, is that construction a little bit clear? I think the def definition is quite detailed. Okay, so I'm going to collect into CE all vectors of length what? I mean, some vectors, some vectors. I'm sorry, not all vectors. Some vectors of length. What is the length of each vector in CE? N plus one, not n. Okay, but each vector, how is how is it formed? The first n bit should should be a should be what? The code word from C. And then what is the n plus 1th bit? It's the pa overall parity of that code word. Okay. Right. Is that clear? That's how I do extension. 
Okay. So if I were to think in terms of parameters of this code CE, what will it be? So this will be, what will be the block length? Block length is the easiest parameter to find out always. N plus 1, there's no problem. What about message length? K, why will it be K? For every code word, you will have a code word here. Okay, so it's K, no problem. What about D? D plus 1 always. Sorry? Okay, let's. Ah, well, it doesn't seem that clear, right? You have to consider two different cases to come up with a complete answer. What will be the two different cases that you have to consider? When will that extra bit be one? That's the problem, right? For each low weight code word, for each code word of minimum weight in C, if that extra bit was one, then what will happen? The minimum weight will become D plus 1. But if for even one code word of minimum weight in C, if that extra bit that you added was a 0, then it will stay at D. Okay. When will that case I described happen? When will for each code word of, sorry, odd or even, right? D is odd or even is the key, key, uh, important thing. Suppose I had D to be odd, what will happen? Right, it will become, it will become D plus 1. Do you see that? Because for every code word of minimum weight, that minimum weight was odd, which means the overall parity will be 1. Do you understand that? Okay, so you have an odd number of 1s adding up. See, you are adding up all the bits of the code word. If the number of bits you added here was odd, then this would be 1. If it is even, then this would be 0, right? It is a modulo 2 addition. Okay, so that is the logic here. So here, this is going to be d plus 1 if, if d is odd. Okay, D if D is even. Okay, so you see this is a different way of dealing with minimum distance. I did not go back to the parity check matrix. Okay, I have not come to the parity check matrix. I am going to come to it soon enough. Okay, we will we'll, we'll look at it closely enough, soon enough. But, but this is a different way of figuring out minimum weight, right? So, all these tricks are used when people talk about minimum weight and all that. Okay, is that clear? The extension, extension part is clear? Okay. So now before I go to the parity check matrix and all that of this, why is this very easy? How can this be directly used for d equals 4? How will I use this for constructing d equals 4 codes? Exactly. So you construct d equals 3 first and then what do you do? Extend it. So the, any extension of the d equals 3 code will have d equals 4. Okay, that's a very simple way of doing. Okay, so that's how you construct for d equals 4. There's no problem. d equals 3 pretty much gives you d equals 4. In fact, you only have to worry about designing d equals odd number. Right? Every time you have a d equals odd number code, what will you do? You always extend and go to d equals or even number. And you're not losing much, right? n goes to n plus 1, k. I mean, in any real design, n and n plus 1 should not be a real problem. Okay, if you, if you can live with a n k code, you should be able to live with a k comma n plus 1 code. Okay, it's not a big deal. It's not, it's not, it will not kill you too much. Okay, so it's not a big deal. Okay, so that's the extension. The next question I'm going to ask is, is I have not come to d equals 5 yet. Okay, that's, that's the non-trivial problem. That's what will require a lot of, and what, what will seem to be unnecessary mathematics, but at the end of the day, it's very useful. Okay. All right. So, so the next question I'm going to ask will be, will test your understanding of parity check matrix, generator matrix, and all that. So, okay, it will tell you now if you have really read about these things outside of class or if you are just coming here and hoping to gain everything from the class. Okay. So the next question I am going to ask is, I am going to say C has generator matrix G and parity check matrix H. I want you to spend a few minutes and come up with a parity check matrix for C E and a generator matrix maybe for C. We will start with parity check matrix. Okay. It will turn out that is the easier one. Find the parity check matrix for C E in using H also. Okay. So you can assume H is known to you and then how will you modify H to come up with the Parity check matrix for CE. That's the question.
Column will not quite be all zeros, but that's the idea. That's the way to think about it. Before you start about modifying, what should you know? You should know the dimension because that will tell you how to modify. Okay, you know what to do. Should you add something, subtract something? How will it look? So that's the first step. Okay, once you do that, and then you figure out how to what to put there. Okay, next step. Okay, so what what will be the dimensions for C for this? This is going to be say n minus k by n. That's okay. Okay, what about for C e? If I have h e, that's going to have dimensions what? n minus k plus 1 by n plus 1. Okay, so if we were to modify this, what should happen? You should add another column and you should add another row. Okay, the way that will work out, I'll write it down and then I'll try to justify it. Okay, so you have to think about this and be comfortable with these notions before you can uh, get there. I'm going to put h here. Okay, the reason why I'm putting h as part of that is I know part of my code word satisfies all the parity checks from h. Okay, so what should I do to make make that happen? I should add zeros, right? So you see that the way I'll do it. Let me write down fully, and then I'll explain the logic. Okay? So I'm going to put zeros here, all the way down here. Okay? Then I know all these are parity checks that will be satisfied by each code word in C E. Why? Because this is zero, so it doesn't matter what the extension is, right? And the remaining bits have to satisfy the this parity. Okay? So you should always visualize H E multiplying a code word on the right. Okay, you should be able to quickly visualize that. So, which columns of HE will multiply which bits of my new code word? So, you see the last column will multiply the added parity bit. So, I make that 0, which means that parity bit is not involved in any of these checks. Okay, so naturally, I'll get the old checks being satisfied. There's no problem. Okay, what about the last? See, I've added an extra row, all ones, right? So, you see the all ones comes in very easily. Okay. Then what's the next thing to check? Should we check or is it all? If you're convinced it's all, it's okay. But there's a technical thing which you have to check just to be sure. What is that? The rank is full rank, right? You have to check that. How do I know the rank will be full? Yeah, the last column, you see, if you had an identity there, you could take that bottom part and then add on the last column. You would get an upper triangular matrix, right? With all ones on the diagonal. And that will definitely give you rank plus one, right, full rank. So all those things you should be able to visualize and convince yourself that this is fine. This is a parity check matrix. Generator matrix, what will you do? What will you do with the generator matrix? Suppose I had a generator matrix G here. What will be the dimensions of GE? K by N plus one, right? So it's very easy actually also to come up with the generator matrix. Don't think of it this way, okay? So all you need to do is what? Add one column what will be that column that you add all ones no can't be ones let me see what is each row of a generator matrix one still k oh well each row of g is what is the valid code word of your code okay so each row of the original G was a code word of your original code. Each row of the new G E should be, yeah, exactly. The, each row to each row, you will add the parity of that row. Exactly. Basically, you do what you did to the code word to extend it and just keep adding. It will not be all ones. You will add whatever is necessary to make that row have even parity. Right? If it's already even, then yeah, you will add a zero. If it's odd, then you will add a one. Okay? And how do I know that all the rows will be, the rank will be full? Rank will anyway be full. You already have identity matrix inside G, you know, so it's not a problem. Okay, do you wish? Can you visualize that? You want me to write it down? You see, you see how you get G, right? G is G, and then here you would add one bit each, and that bit would be parity. Parity of row of G. Okay, so that's what you would do to get the generator matrix. Okay, so you see, you have to use all these ideas when you of, of what the parity check matrix is, what the generator matrix is, what what does it mean for a code word to satisfy a particular parity check? When is it linearly independent? All these things should be very clear to you. Okay, it will help you out in later on in visualizing so many other complex things that we might do with the code. Okay, all right. 
So I don't want to show you an example. I can show you. It's very easy to come up with examples. Yes. <coughs> what do you mean by dependent column? I don't understand. Okay. I don't understand how you got that. Why? Why? D is increasing, right? So? Is increasing. Yes, it's become one more. Yeah. Yeah. So previously, you would have had three columns of H, which were, say, for instance, if you take D equals three, you had an odd number of columns of H, which were linearly dependent. Now, if you take those same columns and add them up, what will happen? Yeah, they will get, you'll get a one below, right? You had an odd number of columns, so you need that extra one to cancel it out, so it will become one. Okay. If you if it if it were to be even, then you don't need that one. They still stay linearly. Okay, so I, I can do a lot of examples, but I'm not going to spend time doing examples. I, I urge you to take the Hamming code and extend it. Okay. It will give you a very, very useful and nice code, which, which again you can start at. It's got wonderful properties. It's the same code as the 844 code I've been talking about, right? If you take a 743 Hamming code and extend it, what code will you get? 844, okay? And that's a wonderful self dual, nice code, okay? So it's it's got nice properties, okay? So you can you can look at that once again. I'll urge you to do it, okay? In the short time we have, I'm going to move ahead and look at the next possible way of changing codes, which is very useful. It's called puncturing. Okay, so so I'm, I'll make further assumptions to simplify my process here. Puncturing is more general than what I'm talking about. So the basic idea in puncturing is you generate a code word according to some code, and then you simply drop a bunch of bits. Okay, some just select some some bits according to some well-known idea, and then drop them. Don't transmit. So what what are what are you doing? You're reducing the block length n. Okay, you're not transmitting something. Okay, what it does to the dimension will not be very clear if you drop. An arbitrary set of bits. Okay, but if you drop only parity bits, what will happen? Okay, suppose I say only I only drop or puncture parity bits, what will happen? The dimension will remain the same. Do you agree? So suppose I take a code word to be MP. Okay, these are the message bits, these are the parity bits. Okay, so the way I'll do puncturing is I will drop some bits from the code word. That's the general definition of puncturing. But I will say I will only puncture or drop parity bits. Once I say that, what will happen? Suppose I decide to drop the last say four, three or four bits. My block length decreases by that number, so it becomes n minus three or n minus four. Why will my dimension not change? Yeah, I still have the same all the messages showing up, right? You have all the messages there. I can still encode k bits into each of my code word right i have 2 power k code words that doesn't change okay but if you also include message bits you have to be more careful it requires a technical study carefully you have to look at rank it's just linear algebra but i'm not going to beat that point so i'll say i'll always safely drop parity bits so puncturing is basically drop parity bits okay See, first of all, the dimension itself will change. You were originally in a n-dimensional space. Now your space itself is reducing dimension. So it's it's still linear algebra. It's not very difficult, but I don't want to get into that complexity. Okay. So suppose I started with a NKD code C. Okay. So this would be k message bits. So it'd be n minus k parity bits, right? So I'll say drop parity bits. The number, okay, actually this drop is also usually said puncture, okay. So you puncture parity bits. So number punctured, number of bits punctured, I will say, say, let's say some P, okay. Okay, I know this. The binary symmetric channel also I use P, but I just want to use P here again, okay. Suppose I say I puncture P parity bits and P I will pick to be less than N minus K. 
Okay. If you have only n minus k parity bits, makes no sense to puncture more than n minus k, right? So I'll puncture less than n minus k. What will be the parameters for the punctured code? Okay, so maybe CP is the punctured code. Okay, so what will be the parameters for this? What will be n? n minus p. K will remain k. Okay, so there's no change there. You still have two power k code. What's what about d? What about d? Yeah, so you need to do more careful study basically. You have to look at all the minimum weight code words and the minimum weight plus one code words, minimum weight plus two code words, see which is getting dropped. Okay, But in general, you can say it will be less than or equal to D. And in most cases, it will be less. Okay, But in general, you can only say less than or equal to D. You can't say anything more than that. It's possible to come up with some weird cases where it can be equal to D also. What will happen if it has to be equal to D? The parity bit has to be... No, no minimum weight code word should be involved with the one there. Okay, all those things can happen, but in general it will be lesser. Okay, you will lose minimum distance when you puncture. There's no way. Typically, good codes will always lose minimum distance when you puncture. Okay, so what about suppose I have a generator matrix G for C. Okay, what will be the generator matrix for the punctured thing? Okay, I think generator matrix is the easiest. In the other case, it's uh, more difficult. Okay, so we'll again assume systematic just to be, suppose I have IP and then I'm puncturing. I should tell you which, which bits I puncture. No, I'll say the last P bits are punctured. Okay, what will be GP? Remove those columns. Do you agree? Just chop off those columns from your generator matrix. So I and then this P chopped off whatever you have. This. Okay, it's the same. Okay, do you see that? Parity check matrix is more, is it more difficult or not? What will you do to the parity check matrix when you puncture? What will you do? I'm sorry? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit more complicated, right? So you have to remove both rows and columns. See, look at the dimension here. The dimension here was k by n minus p. What's the dimension of hp? n minus p minus k. Yeah. n minus p minus k by n minus p. So you have to remove p columns and p rows. Okay. So it's, it may not be the, you can do it. It's not very difficult, but you can always do g first and then go back to p, right? From g, you know how to go to p. You do simply p transpose i n minus k. So I just change in a slightly different way. So let's not do that. Anymore. So puncturing is the next thing. Uh, there's one more operation called shortening. I want to do that just to get used to this these matrices, and then we'll jump to d equals five, okay? Which will happen, uh, which will happen in the next class, okay? So to give you an overview of what will happen next week, I'll quickly finish this shortening, and then we'll jump to d equals five. For d equals five, you need finite fields, okay? It's an area of mathematics called finite fields, and if you're seeing it for the first time, you've never heard about it, I'll urge you very strongly to pick up some book and read it up over the weekend just just to get a feel for the kind of things that they're talking about and then when I come and do it it will be easier for you to digest okay so I'll urge you to look at some book on finite fields or also maybe a Wikipedia site or something there are lots of information out there